Uh, my name is Mark Adem and this is the pandemic. The coronavirus refugee in Copenhagen, Denmark. Welcome to my room. <laughs> So hello and welcome to everyone. I'm Joy Boya, and I'm your moderator for this second discussion in the Resiliat Kenya series of virtual debates and idea sharing. This involves stakeholders from the cultural and creative industries. And in this series, we're looking at the resilience and sustainability of the creative economy in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And I think I'd like to start by thanking uh, UNESCO under whose auspices this event is hosted and it's hosted in partnership with the Department of Culture in the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage, the Kenya National Commission for UNESCO, as well as the Creative Economy Working Group, Tuareza Communications, Alliance Francaise and the Godin Arts Center. And to begin with, I'd like to welcome and invite the director of the UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern Africa, uh, Ms. Anne Therese Ndong Jata to make some opening remarks. Karibu sana, director. Thank you very much, um, Joy. Um, already you, you hear a very familiar face and part of our organization, if I may put it that way. Um, let me take um, just a few moments in you know, um, welcoming also all these um, the lineup of uh, distinguished panelists, um, with very interesting and impressive uh, background. Um, I, I really feel um, very honored that uh, you have found time uh, to be with us. Uh, and let me also appreciate the fact that uh, we are working very closely with the Ministry of Sports, Culture and Heritage um, in partnership as well with our National Commission, Alliance Frances, the Creative Economy Working Group, the Go Down Art Center, and to our Wheezy Communications. I think this is very timely, uh, as you mentioned, is the second uh, down the line, but last week I had a very lengthy discussion uh, with the minister, uh, well, the CS, as we call it here, and um, lots of concerns were raised. And I believe um, these webinars should go beyond just um, discussion platforms. 
I think we should really be now looking at um, some concrete actions in responding um, to um, the effect of uh, COVID-19 um, uh, in this area of uh, work that we have come to, uh, ensuring that we are crafting and reshaping the creative economy for resilience and sustainability. What does that mean? It's a mouthful. And this is precisely what the, the minister said to me. He said, Anne, what can we do? Because we cannot really just talk about it. We should really also be able to ensure um, that whatever action, whatever is being mobilized uh, in support of other sectors. Yes, it's a health crisis, but it has impacted on all the other uh, subsectors. And if there is an appeal, what portion of it would come to the creative industry, the cultural, um, you know, um, entity, uh, as it were. And so I, I went away reflecting on what could really be my response. And I, to tell you the truth, I believe um, the best way to respond is when you get all the stakeholders together, to really come up um, with um, uh, clarity on the way forward. At one point, I even said to Judy, who is, you know, really um, very passionate about the creative industries, look here, um, how can we respond so that even when we organize um, uh, using technology, um, you, you have um, the same fees being collected. Let me give an example of um, uh, the, the, the area of, um, uh, it's also cultural, uh, the religious groups have discovered that most of them who would organize uh, their religious events would collect uh, from the, those who are attending physically, but they continue doing it using their webinars. So how creative can we be so that we can also have online concerts uh, for which um, we would advertise and uh, people who really are very passionate about uh, um, creative industries would also have a way of um, uh, contributing. Uh, this is possible, whether it's a donate button or whether it is through the registration. Uh, just look at the opening. You know, it, it just really helped to lift my spirit because I've been at webinars all morning and just listening to that, uh, for me, I would rather just have allowed more of that than this um, discussion that's going to take place. So I really would, I um, challenge you all, especially Joy, um, let us really be creative. Let us, I want some concrete proposals and some acti activities that we can engage in for which um, there would be um, uh, some returns. Uh, I'm also looking forward to uh, proposals that could help us um, to engage with some of the partners and say to them, this is, these are the need. We cannot just uh, empathize uh, with the industry without really bringing um, the, the right type of responses going from the discussions we had last time. So let me just quickly um, say to all of you, it is indeed an, an honor because I was just, I thought I should open by telling you that um, the, the CS is expecting something concrete from this webinar today. So don't just talk about your problems, give us your solutions. Um, this is the second, as has been mentioned, and um, uh, I hope the discussions uh, from the lineup of, of um, panelists could help us uh, to move to another level uh, where we would be able to concretely show how we are contributing uh, to this sector during this period of um, COVID-19. Uh, during the first um, Resiliat Kenya debate, uh, issues and challenges uh, that the creative industries in Kenya were faced with were discussed, including economic effects, disruption, et cetera, et cetera. In today's resilient um, discussion, the issue um, of democratizing the digital space will be addressed to ensure that creative, the creatives can leverage the digital space and utilize uh, and exploit this valuable resource. The discussion will explore the role of various stakeholders, including the state, and the private sector in supporting and stimulating the creative sector in, context, um, in a context where inequalities accentuated by the crisis have weakened um, the cultural enterprise. 
as we all focus on resilience and sustainable uh, recovery of the creative, creative sector from the ravages of the pandemic, UNESCO is committed to contributing to the protection of the diverse, sustainable, and dynamic cultural ecosystems in our new reality. Through Resilia discussions that highlight the needs of the sector and other related initiatives and frameworks, uh, mechanisms can be developed to help the creative communities overcome the negative impacts of the crisis. And so on behalf of UNESCO, I take this opportunity once again to appreciate all of you um, that would be contributing uh, to the conversation. Um, uh, and uh, as I said uh, at the opening, let us not stay with just um, questions on democratizing the digital space uh, that would be more of talk. Uh, let us really come with something concrete that you can really put before us and which we could also use in engaging our partners that also need what you produce uh, to keep alive. Not only food we need, like I said the last time, you are the soul. So unless you really begin to focus on your role in ensuring that people are able to um, navigate their challenges through this, the time they spend um, uh, being part of your work, um, enduring uh, the, the challenges of the day through uh, the, the production, uh, we would really not be able to have a happy society. If there's anything about happiness, it's not the food, it's not the money, it's also the entertainment, it's also the kind of um, creativity um, that you bring to the conversation that makes life worth living. So I want to again thank you very much. And let it be fruitful deliberations, but let it be one that would be underpinned by actions. So that the next time we meet, we're talking about events. Let's plan for. Um, shows and for which we can collect and we can get donation uh, to really serve those who are not so able to be part of um, some of the, the proposals that you're coming up with. Thank you very much. And um, I will listen through so that I will continue to learn more uh, and appreciate uh, the wisdom that you bring to this conversation. Thank you, Joy. I, like I said, you are part of us now, okay? Your face is now so familiar that I consider you one of my staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam um, Therese and Therese Ndong Jata, the Director of UNESCO Regional uh, Office in Eastern Africa. And thank you, I think, for reminding us, of course, that um, one of the things that we hope can come out of discussions like this are concrete actions and, and way forward. And indeed, I think that that is the the aim of this particular discussion. Um, you mentioned um, enjoying the music of Makadem and I'd like to, to thank uh, Makadem who is holed up in Denmark as we speak. Um, and that is a piece that he wrote while he's sitting in whichever space he is in Copenhagen. And to also thank Michael Soy, who I think we, we know uh, a great um, uh, visualizer of um, what is going on in the social space and his visualizing of the pandemic is both provoking us, I think, to think, but also entertaining and amusing us simultaneously. So thank you to both of those, of those artists. Now, before I introduce the um, panelists, um, our wonderful distinguished panelists, I just want to, to remind those who may be joining us for the first time that at the last Resilient session, um, we had a panel discussion uh, with artists who were drawn from music, from visual arts, from film, um, with experts in IP law, with uh, individuals involved in resource mobilization and cultural policy. And in these discussions, I think some of the things that came up that bear on this question of resilience of the creative economy at this time included the question of a lack of financial reserves um, in, in, you know, for, by, by enterprises and businesses in the creative economy, challenges of the structure of the creative economy itself, um, the question of the digital divide, as we now know, and many of us are falling back to the online space to, to connect and to be able to do a number of different things, challenges of long-term planning and so on. And so we identified these as, as features of, um, of uh, resilience moving forward. And we decided that it would be a good idea to discuss the question of the digital divide, which came up last time, as, as of course, this is um, a moment where we are seeing that the digital is completely stepped up. 
So without um, further ado, because we also know that an hour and a half is not a very long time, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. It's our pleasure to have, I think, um, four very distinguished Kenyans and very capable Kenyans. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, Mr. Charles Morito, who is the country manager with Google Kenya. He's the director of policy and government affairs for Sub-Saharan Africa. And Charles is also very passionate about um, the arts, about visual arts and performing arts and creating platforms that spotlight and showcase uh, these particular art forms. I'd also like to introduce uh, Nanjira Sambuli. Nanjira is a researcher, a policy analyst, um, an, advocacy, uh, an advocacy strategist, and she works of course in the IT, ICT space, in the digital space. But for those who know Nanjira, they also know that she has uh, dabbled in the in, in the arts, in music, and was singing some time ago. And we hope to see her coming back to singing um, in due course. Also with us is uh, James Mamadai. James is a writer, an online publisher. Um, he's with uh, the Bloggers Association of Kenya, uh, and they do a lot of activism on the digital space. And of course, uh, James is part of the creative economy as well. So welcome to James Wamadai. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Joki Wamai. Now, Dr. Joki is actually an academic, but I would also like to introduce her first as an actor. Um, I think that had the dice fallen differently, we may <laughs> be speaking to her as, a, um, as somebody in the performing arts. Um, but Joki is somebody who is a scholar who focuses on the everyday politics of international interventions, African politics, um, Afrocentricism, African feminisms, and we think that her perspectives on, on pandemic moment and the African space in relation to the creative economy and the digital will be interesting to bring into the discussion today. So welcome to all of our panelists, Karibuni Sana. I hope that your mics are now turned on so that we can begin to engage with you. And as we mentioned, welcome also to the attendees. Um, I can see already that you are very active on the side chat bar. We will try and pay attention to that as much as possible so that we bring you into the conversation um, as well. I should say at the onset that um, Charles Morito, unfortunately, will have to leave us at five o'clock. And so we're very lucky to be able to have him for this time. And we will try and focus the conversation in a way that um, can benefit from his insights and his experience um, in his work with, with Google and, and outside of Google as well. Okay, so I think that we're now, what, three months into the pandemic over here in, um, in, in, in Kenya, probably. And I know everybody's getting a bit antsy and a bit, you know, sort of when are we going to open? What's going to, what's going to happen next? And there's been many discussion and there've been many discussions, I think, around the online space, the digital space, and this particular moment. And, and we thought that this discussion to really look at the question of, of uh, ecosystems and particularly the digital ecosystem and the creative economy ecosystem at this time of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ecosystems, as we know, are spaces um, that, that are dynamic, that are interconnected, and that the resilience of one part of an ecosystem um, is, is only as, 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 as well preserved as the resilience of the entire ecosystem. And so the discussion is to really think about how uh, creatives can also become aware of the space that they're sitting in and some of the risks and the opportunities and the questions around resilience if we begin to look at this at, at the level of systems. Now we know it's been repeated over and over again that digital acceleration is something that the pandemic has brought about. Um, and I'd like to probably start by asking uh, the question around who is doing well, um, digitally speaking, and who is doing badly at this particular time. And I'll start with, with you, Charles. Um, I think that when we look at big tech companies, and Google, of course, is one of them, there's Google, there's Facebook, there's Amazon, there's Apple, there's Mac Microsoft. I think we, we, we can clearly see that they are not doing badly. In fact, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook's chief executive, I think at a, at a call that he was having with investors in May, just this year, uh, made these remarks and I quote him. He said, when the world changes quickly, people have new needs. 
And that means that there are more new things to build. So maybe the first question to you, um, uh, Charles, is how has Google responded to the pandemic in this regard, this moment of people needing new things? What new opportunities is Google finding and leveraging at this time? Hi, Joy. Thank you so much for having me as part of this uh, uh, event. Um, it's, it's a pleasure and thanks to the organizers for actually putting this together. I think that um, we need to have more of these engagements. In terms of how is Google responding to the pandemic, um, there's a couple of various ways that we are doing that. Um, the first one is really returning to the core of who we are. The ability to ensure that we're able to disseminate the right information to as many people as possible wherever and however they need it. And we've done that in many ways um, from, from the do the five when we were disseminating information about health, uh, making sure that um, governments and health workers understand um, how the community mobility reports are working and um, if the curfews uh, are working um, to um, the actual grants that we're giving, both from an ad grants perspective, as well as looking at uh, engaging uh, with different organizations who require uh, support from a perspective of uh, community grants, et cetera. Um, so there's a myriad of ways that we're reacting on that basis. Um, but we're also making sure that we, we leverage our products and tools to be able to provide the greater support that they can and to be used as much as possible, whether it's making um, Google Meets, uh, so it pains me that I'm on Zoom, but uh, <laughs> to, for, for all of you on the call, you should know that Google Meets is actually free and uh, performs very well. Uh, so next time I hope to be on that um, and providing that for free across the world um, to making sure that uh, we're able to engage um, on, on with ministries of, of education to live stream courses so that people can be able to access um, curriculums across the board. Um, so there's a myriad of things to be exact. I think we've done something like a hundred plus uh, product changes um, to be able to respond to the COVID uh, initiatives. Um, but there's one which is more specifically uh, relates to this, and that's around Google Ads and culture. And when we're talking about arts and culture, Google is truly uh, an organization that believes that um, arts and culture and history is to be preserved and not just to be available for a few, but truly as many people as possible, as long as you have internet connection. Now we can discuss the depth and the penetration of connectivity uh, at length, uh, but I think for this purpose, we won't go too deep on that. Um, but what Google Arts and Culture does is curates and ensures that we can preserve our history in the best way possible. And here in Kenya, what we've done is we've partnered very closely with the National Museums of Kenya. We've curated over 10,000 artifacts and digitized those. Um, and then we've gone further and actually created different um, initiatives and exhibitions online. Um, the most recent one actually launched um, just on Madaraka Day, um, which reflected across our history. And I think that those are things that we need to continue doing more of. And I really encourage artists to be able to, to, to leverage and see digital as something that they can leverage um, to help them reach broader audiences that they naturally would in the old world. Um, so answering more specifically to your question of who's doing well, I think we can all do well. I think what COVID has actually created is shown us that there's an opportunity around digitization and we can leverage digital to be able to reach uh, markets, audiences, and people who would never be able to engage with in the past. And unfortunately, for those who are forced into digitization, they actually realize that it's quite easy. You can actually be able to easily adapt. And I'm really excited about that. And I'm looking forward to engaging more, both from a personal perspective, as well as uh, from a Google perspective, to continue encouraging the arts and culture world um, to make sure that we continue to drive 
digitization of arts and culture, and most importantly, the preservation of our culture and our history. Because if we don't do that, we're going to lose it. And it's critical that we preserve that culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Nanjira. Right. I think that when, yes, hi there. Now, when we consider resilience at the ecosystem level, you know, when we're looking at, at, at this question, we're really looking at a network of interconnected actors. And in the creative economy ecosystem, for example, you're looking at creative producers, you're looking at organizations, you're looking at institutions, you're looking at diverse supply chains, you're looking at markets and so on. And I think that um, Charles has described some of the opportunities that he has seen have presented from their perspective as Google and some of the adaptations that of course they're, they're quickly pivoting and making at this particular point in time. But would you say that, that while the pandemic might provide opportunities for the big tech companies, um, do you have concerns that some of the smaller players may not be getting the same opportunities and benefits and therefore their resilience is compromised that at the end the big tech players might come out of on the other side even more powerful than ever and the smaller players are, are still undermined? Pretty much uh, is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, you know, this pandemic is just maybe a catalyst. It's like just this span in the works of something that has already been happening, which is those who'd already been uh, getting any sort of like benefits from being connected or uh, able to afford to be connected on any level at individual institutional level are probably proceeding if you're already sort of plugged into for this sort mm. of like remote work and so i imagine for artists whose work is easily uh you know created through the internet or can be uh, uploaded on the internet that's possible but i was thinking about for example somebody who works with their hands a sculptor uh, today who has a very specific type of art as well and their audience cannot come to their market and I think there was a great story that uh, Mwangi Kirubi captured when he did a tour of Nairobi and was taking photographs about mm. this sculptor who's been working for about uh, almost 60 years really trying to sculpt stuff for art uh, for tourists and now he heard he had sort of pivoted to just doing uh, wooden spoons for for cooking and cleaning. And his story probably never would have made it to the internet right now from Wangi going and capturing it. So those who are already online are probably proceeding, but those who are uh, not, it's another barrier that this pandemic has created. And that's the long and short of what tech has done and how tech works. It amplifies what's already existing offline in a sense. And I even wanna tie that to what I think Daniel has already asked here about democratizing a space where many are offline. Yes, in fact, what's happening is that this pandemic has slowed, it's probably going to slow down the rate at which we connect more people. Mm -hmm. It took about three years to get to the 50% mark of having 50% uh, uh, of the global population connected. It took three years. After 10 years before that, it had been seeing 10% of people getting online at a very fast rate. Then we hit a snag and it's been slower to even move from 50 to 51 to 55%. That mm -hmm. tells us there's something there that's complicated. And really what it is, is that we're hitting at the intersection of things or places where people have been left behind, whether they're creatives, whether they are in different markets, they have already been left behind and this pandemic is going to turbocharge that. So the benefits that are starting to be uh, captured for mm -hmm. the digital era, we'll go to those who already were sort of pivoted or had already been aligned to whatever, how the digital ecosystem works, which is another conversation altogether around mm -hmm. the model that the internet rewards today. Um, mm -hmm. We all know, as we say in Swahili, right now, if you're not tweet, tweet, tweeting or you know, selling yourself out there, discovery of your work is not lent to just sitting there and putting your art to speak for itself. So that brings another perspective and that's where uh, to the outlook, um, most times we're asked to say actionable outcomes and give a rosy mm -hmm. picture. So it's it's anything but because again, we're going to have a, a, if we're not careful and we're not honest about it, we're going to leave so many people behind, so many opportunities that could be left unsaid and unseen because the model that works today is very is very is very uh, weapon, sort of like categorized for a very specific niche that not all of us can get through. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, thank you, Nigeria. Maybe I've come to you then, um, Dr. Joki Wamae, um, in relation to this question around the inequities that are being accentuated actually by, by the pandemic more than anything else. I think at the beginning we heard uh, Makadem singing and um, mm -hmm. I tried to hear what he was saying. He said, this is, this is the pandemic. You make yeah. it look like the pandemic, he said. The whole world got an epidemic. 
Fact mm -hmm. is, it's all academic. Now, mm -hmm. would you agree with him that the social distancing, the masks, the hand washing could all indeed be academic because while of course these are necessary measures to take, in the long term, and following on from what Nanjira has just shared, in the long term, is the greater danger that this moment is giving even more power to powerful multinational digital players who because of this digital acceleration and the digital necessity of the moment, coupled with the existing gaping big digital divide across social groups, across territories, across mm -hmm. nations, that really we're further entrenching a question of inequities. And as they continue to entrench themselves, we will homogenize a very rich and diverse African cultural space. So from the Afrocentric Kenyan perspective, what are your thoughts about this? <laughs> Thank you. Wow, Afrocentric Kenyan perspective, that's, that's, that's deep. <laughs> I, I would agree a lot with Nigeria. Uh, and I, I take what Charles is saying. I mean, yes, Google is doing what they have to, but sadly, the internet, as much as Kenya is seen as this um, silicon savanna, or what do you call it? Uh, Kenya, whatever, Africa savanna, or the place where internet, we are, we are, we are quite ahead. Digital technologies will only accelerate those who are already on at you know already running mm -hmm. and so and the challenge with the whole digital uh the digital space it's it's part of a very capitalist global agenda and so and 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 so ordinary i, I was thinking of maasai market traders i think when mm -hmm. charles was talking you know, where is Maasai market now? I, I don't know, is the markets are still not ongoing. I used to go there Saturday or Sunday. What happens to those people? What happens to some Kamba woman or Maasai woman? Is she able to sell her things on the internet? Who, and she didn't go, she doesn't have the access first. She doesn't have the, even how to use that internet. And she doesn't, she's not even able to appropriate that space to keep making noise about her products. What happens to her right now? Think about all those people will go and buy those nice Maasai market things from. Where are they? What's going on? So we need to be very, as much as I, I agree that these fintechs and global multinational companies are actually reaping so, so much in this, in this difficult time. Uh, for good as 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 uh, Nanjira said, an artist who is not part of this uh, big um, space. So we need to be careful on the role of and a very digital economy sadly on a very neoliberal logic and and i've seen even people getting very uh, when for me my question is like why can't we have a google meet by a kenyan and i don't mean those silicon savannah people who come and set up uh, you know by the university of nairobi computer science students or jk you at computer science or kemathi university why can't we have uh um, a, meet, a, a virtual meeting place that we all use, that government supports, so that then, because we are all quickly adopting all this Zoom, Google, and everything, but what happens to, uh, and I think we are just advancing, yes, globalization, but at what cost, or neoliberalism, or a Western capitalist agenda at, at, at our own cost, and at, at the cost of all those who cannot, who are not part of the digital divide, and I if we keep thinking about those Maasai market traders. Thank you. No, thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Joki. Uh, uh, Joy. Yes. If, if I may, sorry, before, uh, I would love to actually um, respond to a couple of key points that were raised because I think that it's really important to just engage on a couple of those. Yes, um, can I, can I, can I, 
I, I, Charles, can I ask you to come to that after James has just made a comment? Absolutely, because fact, absolutely. Yes, yes, sorry. Yes, no, no, that's fine. Because I was going to come to you to then sort of react to, to all of this, because I know it speaks a lot to the space that you're sitting in as well. So I was going to ask James, I was going to say that James, now you're the, the one on the panel at the moment who is sort of representing a, a working creative at the moment. You're a blogger, you're an online publisher. And um, of course, this, this is just one of the many different endeavors that we're seeing trying to, to earn a living uh, on, the, on the digital space. Now, from where you sit and from what you've heard um, your co-panelists say, how do you see these challenges and opportunities of the creative economy ecosystem right now in relation to this accelerated digital uptake? How is that affecting you and your small, you, the network that you sit in, which is bloggers, but also do you have a sense of an impact and an effect on the creative ecosystem more, more, more generally? Um, <clears throat> um, you know, thank you, Joy. Um, you know, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. I think, um, you know, I mean, what has happened, um, I mean, if you think about it from, you know, a creative perspective, and if you think about it from an online, um, you know, content creator perspective, mm -hmm. is that we've picked up, um, you know, a lot of new users. Uh, people are going online um, more now uh, for many reasons, news, um, they also buy more online ETC because they are home. But if you think about, um, you know, for instance, the digital economy in Kenya, it relies heavily um, on brands. And brands um, uh, spend a lot of money, um, you know, online. Uh, they use uh, online platforms. They use online publishers. Um, uh, they use uh, influencers, podcasters, etc., as a conduit, um, you know, for their marketing efforts. What has happened, um, and this is like normal, when there's an economic downturn. At, um, yes, when there's an economic downturn, um, the very first uh, victim um, is marketing budgets. And what has happened is we found like a lot of a lot of brands, um, you know, that were working um, with this, all of these online content creators. Um, the very first thing, when you know COVID hit, they slashed those budget. And when, when I say slashed, I mean hundred percent. Um, and <clears throat> then what happened is, um, you know, a lot of people who relied um, on campaigns, you know, obviously that. You know, obviously that you know completely and totally dried out. Mm. Um, in you know, I mean, in terms of survival, obviously, you know, a lot of people have been, you know, have you know have tried other things, including you know plugging into um, you know the Google Ads network um, that is able, you know, that is able to provide publishers a platform um, to make money based. Um, you know, obviously, I mean, obviously on their traffic. But if you think about, you know, money that you can live with, you need to be, um, you know, at a certain scale, especially if you, if you, um, if you, you know, if you, if you take into account, you know, people who are creating, you know, content on YouTube, uh, the money you may make, or rather you can make on uh, online in Kenya on YouTube is very low. Uh, people who have, um, you know, a certain advantages are people who have, um, you know, text websites um, like myself, um, and you know, those ones, you know, obviously those ones have been able, those ones have been able to, um, you know, those ones have been able to, uh, to, um, you know, to make a consistent income um, through those. Um, I mean, through that platform. There's also other ways. Um, there's a lot of COVID money around uh, content creation, and this is like across the board or or online content creators. So Google had ha um, you know had a call out for um, media, so so media platforms, so, uh, and the media platforms that um, could receive this funding, um, you know, uh, you know, online publishers like myself. 
also the other initiatives, uh, Baraza Lab, um, you know, a media centric um, you know, organization also had, um, you know, a funding uh, opportunity uh, for, for uh, for, for for journalists, but on all platforms, and they were able to give um, grants, um, you know, to to videographers, um, uh, sorry, uh, bloggers who create content online, uh, bloggers, uh, bloggers etc. But if you think about it from you know a top, you know, from a top level perspective, mm -hmm. um, the the smaller um, the smaller for the smaller online content creators, it um, their sources of income are very very um, you know they're very I mean they're very very small and you know I mean and and the funding opportunities if you think about it they do not um, you know they, I mean they do not cover them I feel here you know obviously you know I mean with all these um, you know, new eyes, um, you know, that have come in because, you know, they're, they're looking for new content, they're looking for new things online. You know, I think there's, um, um, you know, I think there's a way, um, there's a way for, um, you know, funders that are operating this space or, um, you know, companies to be able to, you know, to be able to step in to try mm -hmm. and assist um them um you know them survive because at the end of the day i mean um you know i mean content creators i mean obviously there's that passion i mean you you do this because you care but then you know at the end of the day at the end of the day you kind of need to you know obviously pay your bills and i think it is important um you know i mean to you know as a you know as an online content creator for your basic needs to be sorted and then you know i mean and you know and then now um you know and then now you can survive you know however long this thing this thing is going to be okay. um you know to sort of like live right. another day live to create um you know live to create content and okay good um, yeah you know, I think in my I'll, I'll 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 i will jump in there um wamadai cuz yeah i think i think your point made um, and I'd like to bring in um, uh, Charles uh, so that he can, first of all, just react to, to, to what you have, uh, have heard, because some of them, of course, speak very much to, 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 to uh, a big company like yours. But then to also ask as you respond to say that just based on what you're hearing as well, do you think that, that there is a place in a moment right now that there's actually a specific opportunity now for African digital innovation, for Kenyan digital innovation by our creatives and how can our creatives take advantage of this particular time um, as well? Thank you. I, I know that uh, Nanja, Nanjira and I, we uh, sometimes um, always see things from different spectrums, but uh, I think holistically we do agree that at the end of the day, digital should uh, be able to democratize and actually close the gap between the haves and have-nots. Um, that hasn't always been the case, and I think that it's it's more imperative now than ever to actually focus on that particular piece. I will acknowledge the fact that um, there is a, a, a clear challenge, um, especially I'll give a quick example. Um, when you take private schools, they have continued with the education without a beat, and some of the public schools actually have not had any form of uh, um, continuation of, of learning. And those are some of the things that, for instance, uh, we've leveraged YouTube to try and uh, disseminate that information. Um, and, and in addition to that, we, you know, we're working closely with governments, as you do know, um, a, a sister company, Loon, which is a Google sister company, um, has um, deployed um, the connectivity across Kenya and hopefully should actually be up and running soon. Um, and we do have other organizations such as C Squared, which are deploying fiber. Uh, you've seen um, Facebook, albeit it's two years away, um, and Google are both laying cables, uh, both on the east and west coast of Africa to reduce both latency and also the cost 
of uh, international capacity because when you think about connectivity, one of the most expensive pieces of that is actually the content that's flowing uh, from an international capacity basis. That's the most expensive part of it. Um, but I did want to specifically touch on opportunities for small scale traders. Um, and because when I think about it, um, for me, I'm passionate about that because that's where everything is going to be made or bro broken. Um, it's really about the small mom and pop shops, the traders in Maasai market, et cetera. And this is where I'm going to actually call upon um, the, the people on this um, and, and also uh, call upon uh, Ms. Dong Jata um, as she's engaging with the CS um, to really think about the policies that government puts in place in terms of driving a more thriving ecosystem. And I love the fact that, Joe, you're talking about ecosystem because it really is about ecosystem. And I'll give you a, a simple example. Within the last eight weeks or so, there's been somewhere between three and four new tax bills that have been targeted to the digital economy, right? I really want to emphasize that point. Mm. And part of that is withholding taxes. The other part is turnover tax, VAT, and, uh, uh, and also VAT on on, on income that is uh, done on marketplaces. And to Dr. Njoki's point around Maasai market traders, I actually don't think it's a bad thing that Maasai market is closed. And I'll pause there so that you know it sinks in. I know it may be controversial, but what I think is that we need to stop thinking small. We are in a global economy. We are in a global marketplace. Kenya should not be your marketplace. And when you create products, they should not be for the Kenyan market. I challenge all Kenyans and young people, and I see Nigeria smiling hard, uh, <laughs> probably wanting to challenge me. Um, but I know that it's controversial to state this. But a small t-shirt company, a small arts and craft creator should start off saying, I am going to create products that are going to sell globally. And the reason I say that is that when Google started with two 23-year-old kids, let's call them that because that's what they were back then, they set out to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. They were in California, which is one of the largest economies in the world. It's larger than the Kenyan economy. They could have very easily said, let's organize California's information and make it useful in California and they would make a very handsome living, right? And so we need to challenge our youth to really set out the ambition so large that it actually takes multiple lifetimes to achieve. That's what my mother always used to challenge me. She used to tell me, set your ambition so high and so big that you cannot achieve it in this one single lifetime. And the reason I say that is what we should be doing is getting more young people to create global marketplaces so that those traders in Maasai market can be able to access the global market and sell their wares everywhere around the world. Like what Alibaba has done, what Amazon is doing. Why can't we create global marketplaces from here? And okay, that so actually so reaches... Will, so I will jump in, Charles, because I think then you're, you're speaking to, I think the question that that Nanjira and, uh, and Joki and to some extent uh, Wamadai as, are trying to, to drive home. So while those two young people who started Google were sitting out of a capitalistic space in the West um, that, that of course sees the whole world as its marketplace and, and has not given us the same opportunities to build the, the world as our marketplace, where do we start? And so my question is, where do we start you know, now? This is to, to Nanjira, two questions really. One is that, and, you, and you've seen Dan and Yango sort of talk about democratizing the, 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 um, the, the, the digital space. And then you've also seen on the sidebar that perhaps we're just talking to us, ourselves. How do we talk to the people on the ground? So my question to, to Nanjira is this, the internet is clearly becoming an essential service and you are in the space of advocacy. Now, how do we begin to advocate for the internet for digital services as public good services, that it is basically a highway or a road 
that all of us should be able to access. Because once we begin to access it that way, then some of the things that, that Charles is talking about might begin to be seen over here. So I don't have the inaffordability of trying to get onto the internet and, and connect my creativity with that internet. So that's the first question around advocacy. And the second question to you, Nigeria, around advocacy, again, is to do with governments. Because again, you know, as, as um, the Madam Director has said, the CS is very interested in these discussions having some concrete outcomes. Government is the one that really can drive the environment in which we grow through policy, through legislation. If you look at what is happening now with the digital space, look at Facebook. And again, I'm going back to Facebook and I have nothing against Zuckerberg, but we can see that he's eating up the world. Zuckerberg is now embarked on laying 23,000 miles of undersea fiber optic around Africa to link into Africa. What is the policy? What are the policy questions that this raises and how are governments responding to this? Are we ready in terms of infrastructure and finance as governments and as African nations to be able to also benefit from this? So I think Charles, just to then respond to you, you know, to sort of count the question is that I think that there's more needed beyond our Madai being creative and having wonderful content. I think the question of policy and the question of financing and developing our infrastructure basis is really key. So I'd like Nandira to speak to that because I know that this is a yeah. space that you work in. Yeah, and I'm glad because, you know, we've been talking about this from systemic issues and the truth is people still want to have a very warped view of what the systemic issues are. Uh, Charles, it's not just about talent and it's always, it's a truism. Opportunities are just not there and the system, the global system is wired to keep that person in that small place. At the same time, even when they build systems, whether it's their own digital tools or platforms to, to keep their own community sustainable and scalable, it's exactly what you were speaking to about a government then coming in and saying that people are trying to pull themselves out of a particular sort of like straight and then trying to tax the living heck out of them. We have so many systemic issues that must be assessed in, this, in the broadness of the spectrum that it is. There's a question of language that has also come up, which is absolutely true. The internet has created monocultures because certain languages and those, Again, technology is shaped in the image of its creators. We can talk about Schmidt and all these guys who built Google. They were rich kids. They were rich kids. Let's not forget that side of that story. So if we're going to go to this particular aphorisms, we have to unpack them for the complexities and the little footnotes that are usually hidden in the narrative. And the narrative really is that the systems as is, what we are doing at best is having forms of course resilience. We're just finding little ways. And then the moment we gain traction, another systemic, uh, you know, sort of like boulder is thrown down at us. So that to the question of governments, for example, and what they should be doing with infrastructures of public good, the advocacy is there, the case has been made, what it could do for the things they love, like GDP, all those, you know, quants and qualitative insights have been put. Here in Kenya, for example, uh, through the Universal Service Fund, which sits with the Communications Authority of Kenya, for example, there's about a billion, sh uh, billion shillings that have been collected from telecommunications companies. The whole idea for that resource is that it's supposed to connect every part of the country. Uh, if you have been reading the newspapers over time, you will see that somebody has been like, no, no, we want that money to stay there and we actually want it for other BBI-esque agendas. And so what that tells you, that creates this false demand for others to come and create. And then we'll have press conferences that tell us this fantastical tech from these big companies because we have this external gaze from, and, until some Silicon Savannah st uh, style thing is part of the narrative. It's not the stuff has been happening. We have the resources, by the way. Africa is sitting on about $500 million to connect the unconnected, but governments that is that they have collected uh, from uh, service providers. The, um, the strategies on how they could connect everyone, including schools, including um, you know, space and markets, you name it, where people actually are doing what they're doing for this utility to be part of what they're doing, not something they go and plug into at the end of the day, is there. It's the political will. And until we actually uh, take that, and you know, to the question of the tyranny of uh, positive outcomes, uh, that uh, until we actually realize it's about the political will to get the job done. Kenya has been advised till kingdom come, even from other areas like agriculture. The reports are always written and then they end up gathering dust. If we don't use this moment to actually sit with the discomfort of the fact that it comes down to the political will, it's not about another narrative. It's not about creating this if only dichotomy. These are systemic issues and we, could, but we might as well use this time to unpack them and hopefully push back against this onslaught that's only going to get even worse as we come out of this pandemic. Um, and then, uh, you yes. know, I mean, yes. if, if I may, yes. uh, if I may, you know, I mean, I mean, to add on to, uh, you know, what Nigeria said, I think 
for me, I think, um, you know, I mean, obviously the policies, in my opinion, needs, I think they need to come from, um, you know, from a grand level, uh, you know, basically foundational level, um, you know, and then, you know, and then go, go up because I, I, you know, I think in my opinion, if you think about the digital economy, um, the, the, the state in Kenya is, is um, you know, it's very quick, um, you know, to tax, you know, come up with, um, you know, um, you know, taxes, um, you know, around the digital economy, but they're not willing to support it. By supporting it, I mean that when you, you know, when you find a young, you know, growth industry, you'd expect, you know, that there would be, um, you know, policies that would, um, you know, stimulate, um, you know, growth, and then policies that would, um, you know, obviously tax, you know, the people that, you know, are big and already making money, I have no problem with Google, um, you know, Twitter, uh, and Facebook being taxed, but then, um, you know, I mean, how are you supporting, um, you know, the, the young Google, the young Facebook, the young Facebooks in Kenya, and how are you supporting the, the, the young people who are trying to sell, um, you know, products and services, products and services um, online so that they can grow, I mean, in a way that they may not necessarily challenge I mean, these big multinationals, but at least they, but at least they can create jobs. I feel, you know, I feel like in, you know, in my opinion, um, it we, you know, we are heavily taxed in general, but for this sector, the very first, the very first thing that the government did is recognize that these people are making money, and then try and figure out how to tax them instead of first figuring out how to, you know, I mean, how to be able to support them. Last year, um, you know, a lot of people who own, um, who are influencers, um, their digital publishers, um, their own, um, you know, shops uh, online on, on um, you know, either independently on Facebook or Google, or, or sorry, or, um, you know, on Facebook, on IG. I mean, they got all these letters from, you know, from KRA telling them, that they need to come, they need to come within the tax bracket. We know that you're making money, but how, how is government? And then, and then also I feel that in this particular sector, um, you know, to be, for me to be properly recognized, I think we, we, you know, we need to come from a trade perspective. So there's money. Second thing, we are employing people. This sector is employing people, okay. And um, and and they're doing so through digital means. So, trade ministry, um, you know, and the ICT ministry figure out, um, you know, a bunch of incentives. I mean, the same way that you know they do it, you know, for the textile industry, coffee industry, flour industry, etc. The very same thing. I feel that they need, you know, I mean, they need to support, um, you know, they need to support these people, and then. I feel that it needs to be, I, I think there needs to be a Kenya focused, um, you know, digital economy plan. And you will find that it, is, it will then be easier for creatives from painters, whatever. I mean, you know, all those people who are making, um, you know, I mean, you know, all these fantastic things to be able to then uh, plug in as themselves or as a community, I mean, through um, you know to these digital platforms to be able to be able to make money not only for themselves which is very very important but for other people I mean we've seen how small businesses in Kenya have never been you know really supported so you can think about okay. you know this so, way yeah yeah okay good no thanks James so I'll allow Charles to come back in again because I know that he's he's probably going to leave us shortly and Charles so so apart from responding to some of that I then just ask then this systemic question and these multinational giants that are now so embedded is there do you see any chance or any hope for that um, young African innovator to be able to get anywhere 
with alternatives to the infrastructure that has already been laid down, um, alternatives to, to um, all of those various digital software that have become sort of our drug, our everyday drug today? Or has, has the ship sailed for us? Or is there an opportunity for us at all? I wouldn't say that the ship has sailed, but I think we need to be, um, we need to be realistic about how the internet works. Mm -hmm. um, the internet is really about, it, it really is about um, uh, the network effect. That, that is it, plainly put. I'll give you an example. And, and I, I know you'll smile at this. Google Meets is a much more superior product than Zoom, yet we are on Zoom today. The reality is, Right. The reason that Zoom is actually catching so much fire is that a lot of people are actually on this particular product. Mm -hmm. Right. Or if you take so many other tools that have come before this. Right. For instance, if you take WhatsApp versus some of the other uh, elements, the reality is that once the network effect hits, it's it actually catches on like fire. And for you and, and, and this now goes back to simple um, a human psychology is that the, 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 the changing cost, right, is too high for people to change. As human beings, we're lazy. As soon as you get into something, you adopt it and that's where you want to stick. Mm -hmm. So I think that what we have to do is make sure that we look at things that actually work for Africans. And I think that there's a lot of products that we can create that really work and focus on Africans themselves right? And work holistically. And then beyond that, to what I was alluding to in terms of a global marketplace, look at psyches that are similar to Africans, right? And Latin America is very similar. Parts of Asia are very similar. Things that thrive there will thrive here. So how can we also be able to tap into some of those things? And then we can evolve whether we want to get into Europe or the US or some of the other elements of the Western world. And that's fine. So I do think that there's definitely an opportunity for us to create products and services that will reach the global marketplace and reach that. Now, to the point of uh, Nigeria spoke about the, the, the wealth piece. Uh, of the founders of Google and some of these other things. Yes, I absolutely acknowledge that, right? Which goes to your point and also to Nigeria's point about ecosystem, about the right policies being put in place ar around the right education from K1, right? All the way up. How much are we teaching computer science, right? And not teaching computer science just as something that is so uh, removed, Right? But how do we embed it into everything that we do? How do we embed it into furniture making? How do we embed it into farming? Right? How do we make it a system of life? Because when I think about technology, technology actually doesn't really matter to me that much as long as it's not supporting real problems, solving for real problems in our communities, then it doesn't matter. Right? And I, I, I want to give an example of learning lions in Turkana, right? I don't know if you guys know about learning lions in Turkana, but for me, that always excites me because it's in Lodwa and these guys take young people around 20 or slightly post 20, but basically high school graduates and it helps them understand how they can make money on the digital ecosystem. And then the power of that is that they're not coming to Nairobi. They're not going to Mombasa or going to Kisumu, some of the larger cities around the country. Mm -hmm. They're making money and through M-Pesa, through pay, um, PayPal and the likes, they're making money right there in Lodwa, which then builds, talking of ecosystems, a large ecosystem of consumers, right? Because when that young person has money in their pocket, they want to buy soda like any other kid in Nairobi. They want to buy shoes and clothing, etc. What that means is that there'll be a soda shop that opens. There'll be a clothing shop that opens. And, and then I really want to touch on the point of arts because I believe that, you know, we should also talk on the arts piece is also say that there is a comment that came about, it's not always about making money. I agree that it's not always about making money. Over the last six years, I've worked closely with Kenyan artists, right? Providing a platform for them to actually make money. And since COVID hit, 
I had stopped doing my platform, but I have gotten a myriad of Kenyan artists asking me, can I help them reach buyers of art? So yes, it may not be about always making money, but let's be realistic. This is an art form and your art form is the way that you make your living. And we have to be able to say that, you know, at the end of the day, you have to put food on the table and let's figure out what is that balance whereby you don't sell your soul, but you also earn a living because if you do not earn a living, then how, how will you put food on the table? Right. And, and that's something that I've worked with over a hundred different artists over the last couple of years, really helping them provide that platform, including Michael Soy. Right. So, so I think that we need to think about how do we leverage technology to reach consumers, leverage technology when you don't want to sell, but provide that technology so that your art is appreciated beyond. And again, art should not just be for people within the borders of Kenya. Why can't we have Kenyan art appreciated in New York and in California and beyond? And I think that that's something that's important. Nigeria is really keen to push back on my point. <laughs> Just to ask you a question, okay. actually, Charles, on that very point, right? Why must it be about this external locus of validation? What, you know, you gave it's us a not, great example about uh, London, no, but, which is a sustainable community that has localized it. And is actually, these are the models that we, when you talk about reimagining the internet, you have something working for a hyper-local situation. Uh, in fact, it would be very interesting to see if they can do something like community-owned Wi-Fi networks that also host their own content. And they generate demand for what kind of content they want hosted. That's a co-negotiated thing. There are these models that can actually build not just the technical, but also, re, you know, the norms that exist in society and how we negotiate coexistence. And that but should, Nigeria, be, I'm should sorry, be enough in terms of it being sustainable for that community. When we talk about whether it's scalable and how that connects to Nairobi, then that becomes another matter. That bottom-up approach is still perhaps the best way, but this notion that we must always first be consumed in New York and mm -hmm. not consumed locally. No, I, I think Nigeria, you're, mis you're misspeaking okay, to my point. Allow, you're misunderstanding. Yeah, so Charles, Please, Joy, let me just close on this. because I, 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 think I, will, I will bring you right back because I think that Joki will add to that and then you can speak to both of them since that is also Joki's area. So Joki, I'll just ask very quickly whether you have yeah. anything to add to what um, Nigeria has just shared so that Charles can respond to, to both of them. I think we also need to be careful about the gaze. Yeah, the gaze. So for instance, even, I mean, I, and I love and I love what say, Google is doing uh, with Samburu, but at whose, whose gaze, you know, who, who is appreciating um the wildlife you know is it and and it's it so it's important that the because the challenge with technologies when even if we have to be successful half the time it has to be for the western gaze you know and so i mean like i have never watched the 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 this uh samburu but i i will check them out so also, because as some as uh, as uh, Nigeria said, it's technology only sells based on um, you make technology based on who who you are, and most of the time it's classist. Google and Facebook and all that. This is why young men is true in 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 Ivy League universities making technology for themselves, and they're equally privileged. So let's be careful that technology doesn't code, doesn't take. Uh, doesn't privilege the already privileged. And also maybe going back to the question you asked uh, Joy about, uh, so what can we do? I think the African Union just needs to put its house together at the African Union level and also at the national level. Because if the African Union decided, now we have after, after the African free trade area, if, because part of that trade area should also, there should be a technology policy Everybody is now coming to Africa and starting a tech, coming from California, starting a technology with uh, a bunch of Africans and calling it African, you know? And there are so many. So when, and then these people are not taxed and it's good to see those. So, so we need to start having that discussion on a proper technology policy. What is an African technology, you know? Is it somebody who came from Silicon Valley set up shop in Nairobi, employed a bunch of computer science people and calls it African, you know? What is African? And yes, I understand we may not have 
So also, how do we, how does people like Google support? Like in, in we have JKU, what do you call it? Pausti. We have a whole Pan-African University of Science and Technology. I don't know where they are doing computer science. So the whole, uh, they're trying to build these centers of excellence around Africa. So invest in, for instance, the Pan-African University where they're doing computer science. So they're at par with these people at Silicon Valley in Stanford. And we can develop our own technologies. Africa, we have, is it more than 1 billion people? If we locked that market, there was, the way um, China did, you know, this Alibaba, when Jack Ma started Alibaba, there's no Amazon to compete, you know, there was no Jumuiya to compete. So how do we start our own technologies and have an African Union voice that locks and says, look, we are supporting our African technologies, we are this number of people, mm -hmm. African artists, markets and all that, so that we can actually appreciate our power of numbers and also our expertise. You find also Africans are the ones in these Stanford universities, and yet they are, they, are, they are not recognized. I was reading now in this Black Lives Matter, somebody talking about working, I think, in these Facebook Googles as an African and the discrimination, you know, that goes on sometimes, whether it's subtle or microaggressions. So we need to be cognizant of this. and. And for me, I take back to the African Union at, and also the national government, they need to put policy in place. It's been too long, especially here in Kenya, we are, we are, we are seen as this center hub of technology. We need to put our act together. Okay, so Charles, we'll bring you, we'll bring you back in. And I think I've, <laughs> I've, I, I've liked some of the things that I've heard, but what I'm hearing is that the idea of resilience, because again, remember that this is the heart of these conversations is that the pandemic has, has, has knocked a blow. And we're sort of saying, are we going to be able to survive this and absorb this? And one of the things that is very clear around this time is the, 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 the digital. And so we're talking about a resilient African digital space or digital interaction, um, technological developments. Can you speak to that even as you respond to them? Yes, let me start with the resilience, and I think that's a fantastic point. And Joy, thanks for pulling us back to the mission of this call. Um, let's be honest, when you're talking about resilience, there's less money in Kenya than there is in other countries. And this is why I want people, uh, both Nigeria and Dr. Njoki, to understand that I am not saying that we start off without solving our problems and just pandering to the West. I said, let's solve our problems. Let's be authentic to what we want to do. But there's no problem with us making money from the West. The West has been making money from Africa for the longest time. Let's do the same, right? And the, when we look at Kenya, Kenya is less than $100 billion GDP, right? It's not even a tenth of the California GDP. Right? We need to start understanding and being candid with ourselves in terms of where the opportunity is. And we will not be able to pour milk into someone else's cup when our cup is empty. So what I'm saying is let's build ourselves, right? Let's not sell our souls, but let's be authentic. And there's no problem if someone in the West appreciates art the way I appreciate it right here in Nairobi. There's nothing wrong with that, right? When you take a show like Friends, Friends wasn't made for Kenya, but they made money out of Kenya because they made comedy that translated beyond the California borders, right? So why can't we create art that we love, that is authentic? Earlier on, I mentioned about curating and making sure that we, we sustain our culture and our history, right? Let's talk about colonialism. And let's make sure that that history doesn't get lost. But if someone can appreciate that history from beyond, there's nothing wrong with that. And the resilience piece of it is saying that if we cannot be able to sell at Maasai market, but I can leverage an online platform so that I can be able to ship a particular sculpture or art piece to New York, leveraging DHL or FedEx or... UPS or whatever, you know, um, and, and send it out in two, two days or three days, 
I don't think that there's a problem with that. And I think that when we're talking about resilience, resilience is making sure that we're authentic, that we can make a living, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is if uh, sticking to Dr. Njoki's point of the Maasai market trader, she needs food on her table. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that she gets food on her table if she cannot walk down to Maasai market on a Tuesday and sell? If no one is coming to Maasai market that particular day, but someone can be able to click when they're in Kileleshua or in Mombasa or in New York or London, it does not matter to that mother of three who's selling that sculpture in Maasai market. And I think Njoki and Nanjira, I, I saw a comment saying we're speaking to ourselves. It's very easy for us to push back and say, let's not go global. But for that person who's hungry, they don't care where that money comes from. And we're talking about resilience, that's how we should be humble enough to say that for the person who is in need, let's find a way of building an ecosystem that helps them thrive. And when people have food on their table, they can think about the other things on the Maslow's hierarchy. But at the okay, end of me... the day, we All need right. to be able to support them on that. Uh, All right, let, think, me bring, let me bring James in. But James, about, let, me, uh... let, me bring you in, let me bring you in in this way. Because yeah. the reason why we're having this discussion is because the creative economy intersects very much with the digital space. In fact, it is yes. an aspect of the digital economies. Yes. Is there another piece in this conversation, which I'd like to, to ask you now as, as a creative on this space who is working on the online space in particular? Yeah. This is a space which we know, and, and uh, you know, I'm of another generation who is trying to understand this space, but it, we know that it's a space where things, new things come up all the time. New frameworks, yeah. new tools, new paradigms, new techniques, yes. Um, yes. new opportunities for, for monetizing, for engaging for being visible. Do you think that the creative economy, that practitioners, actors in the creative economy are keeping up with what is happening in this space in order to best leverage the space? And then speaks particularly about yourself. Do you think we're keeping up? And is this another piece that is missing in terms of resilience you know, think, in this space? Yeah, I think, I think for creatives, um, I think for creative, I think that uh, uh, you know, two classes of creatives, if you, if, um, you know, I mean, to answer your question, so there are two classes. There, there, there are people who are digital first, and and so for them, um, yeah, I mean, this space is, you know, I mean, you know, as in it's, um, you know, sort of obvious because they are in this space because they, um, you know, the work, um, you know, I mean, the work they would do, they, the work they do is digital first. So think about. You know, podcasters, bloggers, influencers, influencers and bloggers. Now think about you know the other creatives. I mean, who are already making money, you know, through other channels, um, but they've they've either had to learn over the years or they've been forced now, you know, because of COVID, to use these these you know digital platforms to be able to um, you know to be able to like um, you know plug this. Um, uh you know their products you know you know their products or services the thing is um i think um that it has always been hard in general because um think about it from a kenyan context um yes we do have you know around 20 million kenyans who are, are online but then you know um the 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 economic power of these Kenyans is actually not um, enough to be able to like sustain um, sustain all these people. And then also, if you think about um, the question of access, um, be, um, creatives being able to like access, um, you know, um, you know, good internet so that they can um, publish, uh, take. Um, high quality images and then share even afford to get someone to take these high quality images then mm. you know i mean there's i mean there's already a problem um when when you think about internet in kenya i think internet is is fantastic in um 
in general, but for Nairobi. And then also Nairobi is not Kenya. So there are very many, there are artists and uh, bloggers, vloggers, etc., who are really struggling, um, you know, to get, um, you know, the basic thing, which is, which is basically, um, you know, content, um, you know, content out, uh, and then, you know, and then, and then also something else. Um, they also struggle. They also, you know, they also struggling to be known. Sometimes, you know, I mean, when you, you know, when you're bigger or when you progress, obviously you need to like spend a bit of money either on Google Ads, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Is something they don't have because obviously, I mean, they're starting out. They're you know, their farm base, in my opinion, it, their farm base is, you know, is still very small and they're not making, you know, a lot of money, um, you know, a, around, um, you know, around this digital platform. So, it, it, you know, there exists a problem um, of access. And, and, and I remember Nigeria talked about how, um, you know, the communications, um, you know, authority of Kenya has a whole budget. Actually, it's not one billion; it's ten billion trillions, um, and they are supposed to, they, and they're supposed to extend, um, you know, broadband to like as many you know uh, as many places in Kenya as possible. But it's you know it still hasn't happened. I mean, they're still sitting on so much. It's sitting on so much money. On the other side, Safaricom is expensive. Airtel is expensive. Telecom is expensive, so it's I, for me. I think it's a, you know, I'm, for me, I think it's a whole problem of, um, like I said in the, uh, like I, like I said earlier, I think it's a whole problem of, um, of government support because if you think about it as a, an overarching problem, we need more people online. But we also need the, these all these content creators to be able to afford, um, you know, to be able to afford to be in this um, in this space, and also the people the people that we are targeting, um, you know, obviously also they need to also afford, um, and that's a different conversation. Obviously, afford our wares and also afford to be online. So that they can be able, so that I mean, so that they can, so that they can be able to, you know, to see, you know, this product and see, experience whatever, and eventually in that customer journey to be able to buy it. So it's, okay, so it's, yeah, so so I so I hear you. So basically, what you're saying, in a sense, is that the question of even just working with these tools, understanding, staying updated, the first challenge is 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 even having access. The affordability yes. of of the internet first of all so you know so the problem yes. goes a few steps back and so i think just as we as we begin to get to the end here i just want to ask nanjira because you've mentioned um wamadai um this question of affordability i think it's been interesting to see and i think at the outset when we started um charles shared with us some of the things that google has been doing in term in, in at this time you know trying to trying to of course give um uh, information to people that that you know that 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 is credible, um, free Google Meets, etc. In other words, how are you trying to make the space accessible to people? Now, locally, one of our telcos, Safaricom, has also been trying to do the same, and I have been trying to track what they've been doing from time to time. And Nanjira, you again as the um, as the as the 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 kind of digital snoop, if I can call you that. What do you have to say about? some of the things that a Safaricom has been doing. Safaricom has made certain adjustments as well in this particular time and is continuing to make adjustments. Data bundles, 8 GB is 20 Bob. And so, you know, somebody can catch a live stream on, on YouTube. Um, I noticed recently, you know, pay bill to pay bill, direct payments now possible. Um, I noticed that they, they were giving certain concessions to frontline um, workers. Uh, the conversion of bonga points to be able to shop with. Um, when you see this, I mean, when I see this, I sort of say, if you can do this now at a time of trouble, and I know you're still making a profit, then how can we have a fair system where we are sort of not discussing this question of inaffordability and lack of access, um, where people can still profit and, you know, the bulk of the population can work with this space that is becoming a part of our life now. When you see this going on, what, 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 what goes on in your mind? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Safaricom and even Google and others globally um, in terms of what they've been able to do, and especially around uh, information that we should see especially around coronavirus. One thing that it's shown us is, oh, Kumbe, they can do that. <laughs> so we can't go back to a place where it's just like, oh, no, we're just producers or we're just these technical guys who don't know what's going on there. There's a statement that has been made that creates a moment that we mm. have to hold them to account. Uh, mm -hmm. for as a, as a, is it sort of like demand uh, uh, the, the capacity we can to generate demand and so even for companies Safaricom is a, in a sense a very Kenyan company and does have a great record of adapting to the circumstances for their consumers which is great uh, but you know the, it, it'll come down to the internet and all uh, its various layers uh, there's different actors who are trying to mon uh, sort of capitalize and commodify every aspect of it, right? Um, and so when you see even Google becoming a service, it's sort of under sea cable provider, it's ideally maybe one day you're in the internet of Google in a sense, which is one way. I think it's a moment, and this is a global conversation happening now on how we can have new metrics and new mm -hmm. values around mm -hmm. this internet ecosystem. It following the sort of capitalist hyper blitz, there's a term that they use now in Silicon Valley, blitz scale, just get everything, commodify everything. You know, um, it's not working. It's leaving too many people behind. The move fast and break things model that was, that created the Silicon Valley culture has broken societies. So mm -hmm. it is a reckoning in a sense. And these are, these uh, shifts that they've made during this time, we must make sure that they, we, we, see, we don't see that ground back and say that we're just all consumers and we, we're locked in, we're just grateful to have internet. Internet. We have to keep that in mind and keep pushing till we have new norms and new normals. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And I think, folks, I, I'm just looking at the side to see whether there's any particular questions to yourself, Ben, and you've been very good at um, responding to them. Uh, well done, I think, Nanjira. Well done, Charles. So I see things are picked up on the side, and you get on with them right away. Um, but I think that we're coming to to the end, and I just like to because, of course, this is. A, a, a big discussion, but the whole point of it for the creative economy is to understand that the conversations that we started last week, which were conversations around the impacts at the very individual level. How have I been impacted as a musician? How have I been impacted as an arts organization? To understand that those impacts sit within a system. And that system, as we've been trying to discover and discuss today, also has its inequities. And that if we're going to be discussing resilience, at the level of the individual organization or the individual practitioner or artist, we really must be aware and to discuss and enter those discussions around resilience at the ecosystem level as well. So I hope that we are, we are seeing that, we're seeing that benefit. So the conversation has not been, you know, very directly, how do I get some money? I am not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, performing now, the, you know, the, the clubs are closed, but to sort of look at the long view, which was part of the conversation that also you know, part of a point that was brought up in the conversation last time, which is that there's immediate effects now and things that we must do now, but there's an opportunity to really look at the long view and to begin to pivot now around things that we should and can change um, for the future. So, which brings me to, to I think, some, some closing reflections from our panelists. I think that um, maybe I start with, maybe I start with, uh, with um, uh, Joki. Predictions, and I know predictions are, are, are of course, like uh, tossing a bunch of seeds somewhere and, 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 and hoping for the best. But what do you predict will emerge in the socio-political sort of post-COVID environment for Kenya, um, based on, based on, 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 on your, your professional area, um, that could impact the creative economy? So I know that, of course, the creative economy is not your area of, 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 of professional study. But if you're looking at the wider socio-political space and these discussions that we've just had around the digital, digital ecosystem as well, what, what do you see and what kind of predictions do you see for, this, for the creative economy that we should be aware of? Thank you. I think one thing we've, we've all seen is the value of uh, the crea creatives and, and the creative economy. And, it, it was interesting at the beginning of COVID for people to see on social media, many people saying, you see, actually we don't need these politicians. All we need is the doctors and the doctors or you know, artists. So I think this pandemic has shown us the value of the artists, the value of that creative economy, which was always put as an add-on to the, especially in Kenya where I think we're hyper-political 
you know, politics, sector, sector center stage and everything else, even artists are there to entertain. So it's in, it's in, I think we need to carry that with us, the value of, 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 of the arts and not just for entertainment, but also for archiving, you know? So at this, at this time, we, our artists are the ones archiving, like you can see Soy's painting of what's going on or what Makadem was singing about. And it's important that Charles, I hope you're going to archive this also uh, within uh, Google as we continue creating our own local archives. So archiving. So I think uh, artists read the times and it's important at that time. And we've seen even political uh, and social and times of difficult social struggles. So that for me has been uh, a big thing. And also another, the second thing is agency. Our agency at, at, at a very local level, we are always, and it's in all sectors, whether it's the economy, uh, we've You're breaking up a bit there, Joki. Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So I uh, so I first talked about um, the value of the artist and the arts, and the second is the value our agency. It's time we recall our local agencies as not just artists but i think uh, um, all of us in terms of surviving even without our connection to the global economy as much as we are i mean we are connected remotely but it's you know we produced our own for instance ppps and that kind of thing so we can survive many people now are not said you know surviving on on, on some connection to the global economy. So for me, it's how do we use that to make our economies thrive? You know, and also I think that's something else that has emerged in this period. Many times, all we do is work, work, work. Many, many privileged people, because many people without privilege uh, took time to start thinking, what about our health? So those are the three things I think we need to take forward post COVID. Thank you, thank you very much. And I think you point out very clearly for the sector that, that its value in terms of its engagement and connection with a wider socio-political ecosystem has now been proven and that we really must leverage that. We really must leverage that. Um, I'll come to uh, Muamadai. So what is your own prediction around how the Kenyan digital space might emerge post COVID and the creative economy in relation to this digital space, negative and positive. Maybe um, some things I won't think, change now that we know we don't have access. <laughs> true. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, the digital space has, you know, I mean, has always been an enabler, um, but it's an enabler um, in a way to think about the, you know, multi, you know, multinational platforms, um, you know, that most of us employ. For instance, if let's say today, um, you know, the money that, uh, you know, someone will make from Google ads on your website, on your, you know, on your website or on YouTube is way less than, than in Nairobi than say someone, you know, who creates the same content and videos in, uh, in you know, in for instance, the US, and and these inequalities are you know are basically um, you know um, you know enabled um, you know by you know by these companies because they feel that um, you know on you know on you know on a certain location this is what we I mean this is what this is what we feel, you know, this is what we feel that you're worth. And in my opinion, I think that, you know, that obviously that's a conversation that, you know, um, you know, that we need to have, um, that we need to have going forward. And also, um, digital cannot survive um, without offline policies um, in the sense that, um, you know, then there needs to be policies that, support um, and promote people people creating 
um, you know, and selling their product or services, um, you know, on on these platforms at a local level, because, um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you need you. I mean, you need you know to put like a certain input and be able to um you know make make you know a certain level of money but also at the end of the day you need to be supported in a way that you can earn a, you know a very good living um you know a living that can support um yourself and others and then also you need to you know be in a you know um you know be in a space um you know that you can act as a mentor and you know promote other people so um there needs to be a lot of policies i mean obviously not not all these digital taxes you know that that you know the government is formulating and trying to like go after all these people but i think there needs to be like a way um you know to push this you know to push these people to push this super app so that they can they can be able um to totally make um you know make money from you know let's say where they are but also be able um you know, to have to have the capacity based on their revenue to push, you know, all these goods and services everywhere. I mean, including, you know, the states, all these markets. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Charles, thank you for staying with us actually until the very end. So I guess it's I, exactly I had the, to. Yeah, no, wonderful. Exactly the same question, your own predictions around what the Kenyan digital space will look like. And in relation to the creative economy as well, um, after this, after this, this, this moment, negative and or positive. I think it's going to be positive. Uh, personally, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, I, I think predictions. I, I wouldn't predict. I'll just say sort of what I think is just going to continue, which is the mm -hmm. fact that digital is here to stay. It, this, you know, this this cat is out of the bag. We're not pushing it back. It's it's done, right? So we just need to figure out how to embrace it and and find a way of uh, um, building the ecosystem. And and so in terms of just my closing thoughts, um, I just wanted to close with three thoughts. Um, the first one is that as a as a creative ecosystem, we need to organize. We need to find a way that actually we rally together and uh, I, I wouldn't say unionize, but really organize in a manner that our interests as creatives are taken care of and that are, it, it's not a thousand drops. You're actually talking about the bucket full, right? It's more meaningful instead of just a drop. And, and so the element of organizing, I think is going to be really critical. The second piece, which is now related post-organizing, is lobbying. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to lobby. And you can't be able to be taken seriously if you haven't organized, right? So that has to be those two things. I see them going hand in hand. So you organize fast, lobby, and ensure that we're creating an ecosystem that is taken seriously because the creative industry is one to reckon with, right? For many factors, one, cultural, two, economic, right? And we cannot negate any of those two and the value of those two elements. So we need to be able to lobby and get the right resources in terms of policies, right? So that we can actually have a proper, um, I, I know you've been working hard on, on, on a, a museum, Right? Why don't we have an amazing modern art and history, you know, cultural art museum in Kenya, if not two or ten? Right? How? But that will only come if we can be able to have the right policies in place, the right ecosystem that is robust, um, that makes money. I know some people don't want to hear this piece of money, but you cannot be able to do that if you don't have money. Things cost money. At the end of the day, someone has to pay for it. Right. And then last but not least is embrace technology. Right. And the piece around embracing technology, I'll go back to the point of saying, let's be ambitious. Let's be bold. 
Let's not be shy about what we can accomplish. And let's not feel that if someone in New York or California loves my Michael Soy painting that I'm selling out. No, I want it to be loved. And I want Muragori's art to be loved. And I want, you know, uh, Masharia's pictures to be reputed as they are by Oprah. And she loves it, right? Why can't we, why can't our artists be global artists? I'm not saying that they don't, appreciate the Kenyan ecosystem, but why is it that we don't want that? I don't think that it's, a, it's, it's binary. I think we can live in both worlds. We're a global world. So I just really want to summarize and say, those are my three takeaways. Let's organize, let's lobby, i.e. build the ecosystem, the right policies. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Njoki, your point around digital on Afikta, it is there, it's protocol three. When it comes to Afikta, there's going to be a digital protocol, right? And they're going to be discussing it later on this year, right? So you should be able to even put your thoughts and feedback as that is coming together in AU, right? Because these things are there. And then last but not least, let's embrace tech. And with tech, we make the world a small place, right? And we can be able to enjoy the fruits of a globalized economy. Thank you so much. And really, thank, thank you. you so much, Joy for thank everything you, and you. for leading the conversation. Thank you, well said, thank you. And Nanjira, we give you the last word here. So again, the same, the same question around your it. sense, yes, your sense of the, the after. As with all things Kenyans, we have such amazing ebbs and flows that there's no way you can predict. There's no logarithm, no faranga via computer to figure this thing out. <laughs> and it's actually on that note that I want to make my final reflection. I think uh, one thing that's already happening now that's really showing that we are onto something in Tunjoki's point about rehabilitation is actually this conversation on Kenyan creatives deserve better. I think mm. that has been really encouraging to see and uh, it's seeing how it's also going to systematize the new normal. It's not just the coerced resilience that we just take it, we take whatever scrums and crumbs that come because creativity is the heart, at the heart of it and is what is also going to make this tech viable and sustainable. So it's not just even about the creatives embracing tech, but the tech uh, creating demand for tech to respect that creativity is its lifeline because that's the last vestige. Artificial intelligence and all these other emerging technologies are trying to figure out how to commodify what you do very well. There's actually, you should check out this cool, uh, well, interesting work where a machine learning system was taught to write son uh, sonnets, but still couldn't do the work of an artist. So the artist is still the soul of this world today. So you might be told, you might be bitten down the path, you're always the last ones to be considered, you're always, you're always the last ones to, to be heard, even in policy, whereas the lifeline and the soul and nurturing that and healing that through narrative conversations like Kenyan creators, Kenyan creators deserve better is a starting point. And I think it's really going to help the soul of the nation to start rehabilitating itself. So keep doing what you're doing. It's not always about pushing. You've done enough rest as Njoki was saying, we, we salute you. We owe you a lot of gratitude. Thank you so much for everything that you do and you'll continue to do. Thank you. And, and I think on behalf of the Resiliat team as well, to now thank all of the attendees and in particular to join me in thanking our wonderful, wonderful panelists. I think that you all gave this discussion a good go um, for an hour and a half that we had with it. So thank you very much to Nanjira Sambuli. Thank you to Charles Morito. Thank you to James Madai, And thank you to Dr. Joki uh, Wamae. Um, these conversations are anticipated to continue you know, from one month to the next. And so we hope that the third one will um, be coming in a month's time, but that announcement will be made in due course. So thank you all for participating, for engaging along the side and speaking to the panelists and speaking to each other. And I'd like to ask the panelists to um, stay, stay online a little bit longer as we gently uh, ask everybody to leave the party um, so that they can then just do a debrief. But thank you all very much indeed. So I guess Azita will probably put on the um, we'll probably put on Makadem maybe one more time if we could and 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 allow the allow our, our attendees to leave. Thank you, Joy. Before I leave, it oh was, yes, it was a wonderful um, debate. I've taken notes and I hope we will be able to catch up later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well.